Hello, everybody. My name is Hugo Garcia Larriva, and I'm from Ecuador. I want to thank to the organizing committee members of the 2022 New York Arbitration Week for its kind invitation. To answer the question, who is in charge of arbitration, today I will share with you a brief overview of the relationship between arbitration and the judicial system in Ecuador. It is commonly said that a chain is only as strong as it, its weakest link. No surprise. If arbitration were to be a chain, its weakest links will be, first, the respect for party autonomy, second, the ability of an arbitral tribunal to retain and assert its jurisdiction, and third, except for specific circumstances set forth in the law, the respect and immutability of arbitral decisions. I submit that recent developments in Ecuador have strengthened those links and therefore arbitration is much stronger now. I will mainly refer to two principles developed by the Constitutional Court of Ecuador, the principle of minimal judicial intervention and the principle of undue constitutional interference. In terms of the first principle, the Constitutional Court has stated that derived from the constitutional recognition of the contractual and alternative nature of arbitration, its effectiveness also depends on a duty of respect and independence towards arbitration from the ordinary justice system an indiscriminate judicial control will transgress the alternative nature of this system and will leave the will of the parties without effect. In relation to the second principle, undue constitutional interference, the Constitutional Court has ruled that the Court cannot neglect also to mention that it is not allowed to denature a constitutional injunction by using it to attack decisions rendered by arbitrators or arbitral tribunals, since these will constitute a breach of the Ecuadorian legal order that expressly forbids a constitutional injunction be filed against decision of jurisdictional nature. If not, the constitutional justice will unduly interfere with arbitration. Both principles are aimed to guarantee, first, the respect for party autonomy, second, the ability of an arbitral tribunal to retain and assert its jurisdiction, and third, the respect and immutability of arbitral decisions. In relation to party autonomy, it is not contested that parties are allowed to agree to arbitrate their disputes through a fair and neutral procedure tailored to the needs of the case, always ensuring that due process is followed. The Constitutional Court has clarified that since party autonomy is the cornerstone of arbitration, provided that the basic guarantees of arbitral due process are respected, parties have a broad freedom to agree on the rules for the conduction of arbitration. The court has also recognized the concept of arbitral due process as an autonomous set of principles that differ from those pertaining the realm of the judicial due process. In relation to the ability of an arbitral tribunal to retain and assert its jurisdiction, the regulations to the Arbitration and Mediation Act enforced since 2021 provides that arbitration and mediation centers and arbitral tribunals shall have full independence and autonomy and shall not be subject to any order, provision or control of any authority that will undermine their powers. It is forbidden for any state authority to exercise control or to interfere in the functions of arbitration and mediation centers or arbitral tribunals. Regarding the respect and immutability of arbitral decisions, the Constitutional Court has established the limits of the annulment procedure of arbitral awards, restricting any judicial activity 
only to an in-procedent review and subject to the specific grounds set forth in Article 31 of the Arbitration and Mediation Act. Furthermore, following this line of case law, Article 13 of the Regulations to the Arbitration and Mediation Act provides that the annulment procedure must respect the alternative nature of arbitration and follows and must follow the principles of minimum intervention, specificity, stopper, among others. I submit that these recent developments in Ecuador have strengthened arbitration and have ratified that parties are in charge of their arbitration. Thank you for your time and attention. Good morning, everybody. I think we can get get started, which means Santiago, you can find any any seat. Oh, that one's good. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here in person and uh, welcome to those who are attending virtually as well. My name is Lee Rovanescu. I'm a partner with the International Arbitration Group with Freshfields here in New York. And on behalf of Freshfields, it's my pleasure to welcome you to day two of New York uh, arbitration Week, um, and in particular to this uh, event that we're hosting uh, here with uh, CPR and with our friends at Tosini Freire. Um, if you were at the opening reception last night uh, and then somehow got coaxed into going to an after party or to some kind of a bar for drinks, then thank you for being here and being brave to be here early in the morning. There's coffee on the other side. No one will be... Um, uh, disappointed if you go and refresh your coffee cups before we get started uh, in a few minutes. Um, I'll just say a brief word about, about our international arbitration team here in the U.S. Uh, the Freshfields team is divided between New York and Washington. We have representatives from both offices here today. Uh, it's comprised of about you know, six partners and around 40 associates who are mostly multilingual, speak Spanish and or Portuguese, <coughs> pardon me, as well as English. Uh, and cover disputes all around the world, but with a with a big focus in Latin America, which is relevant, of course, to today's event. I've got two logistical notices for you all. First, for CLE, which is important because we have an illustrious panel. We should all get the CLE credit to benefit from what we will learn today. There's a sign-up sheet outside for in-person events in New York. You have to unfortunately physically sign in and then also sign out at the end. Uh, so please do that. There are three sign-up sheets just outside. Um, uh, so please remember to do that. And for those who are attending uh, virtually at some unknown point in the middle of the presentation, someone will announce the secret CLE code. So please take note of it so that you can fill in your CLE form. So that's the first logistical notice. The second one is once the programming has been uh, is, is complete and over, um, and when you're engrossed in interesting conversations, or even if you're engrossed in uninteresting conversations, please continue them in the cafe next door, because I am told that this space is needed for further meetings and events that are taking place shortly thereafter. So you have all the health warnings, and with that, uh, any further ado, I'll introduce uh, Kinar Nahikian, who's CPR's Manager for International Programming and who is co-hosting this event with us here today. Kinar. Thank you, Lee. And uh, thank you, of course, to Freshfields for hosting us today in collaboration with Tosini. We're grateful to collaborate with our members in this way to bring fantastic programming like this for New York Arbitration Week. And so, uh, as Lee mentioned, I'm with CPR Institute. For those of you who are not familiar with CPR, uh, this is the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution. CPR has two arms made up of our DRS side, which is our dispute resolution services. This has our distinguished panel of neutrals and our expert case management services, which are available. On the other side of CPR is where I work on the CPR Institute. The CPR Institute is made up of uh, our membership comprised of corporate counsel, uh, law firm practitioners, independent neutrals and academics who share a passion for dispute resolution and conflict prevention. 
Uh, our membership is what fuels our passion to continue this. We are a nonprofit organization started in 1977 and we continue today to bring innovative new ways to continue the dialogue and continue our advancement in dispute resolution and prevention. So uh, thanks again for joining us. We have, a, a, it, I think we're at full capacity today or we will be soon once everyone comes in from breakfast. And we have, uh, I believe another 200 people online joining us virtually. So welcome to both of our attendees in person and online. Um, I do want to mention that this program today is one of many CPR programs that we offer. I hope you'll join us for some of our upcoming programs, including our global conference on December 7th. This is a virtual conference. It's free and available to the public, which is one of the things I love about CPR that we do offer this from time to time, in addition to our membership programming. Uh, and this conference, the theme this year will be mediating business disputes here, there, and everywhere. And this is a testament to our membership, which is global in nature. We'll have panels from our YADR, which is our young leaders group, in addition to panels from our European Advisory Board, Brazilian Advisory Board, and Canadian Advisory Board. So four fantastic programs uh, all together in one day under the auspice of mediating commercial disputes. And they'll discuss various um, phases of mediation and very, various uses of mediation. So I do hope you'll register and join us. We have our CPR table for those of you who are here in person. Uh, stop by our CPR table to get more information about the global conference. And those of you online, uh, you can go to cpradr.org to sign up for any of these programs. And uh, as we're all returning back in person, I'm happy to announce that CPR is bringing our annual meeting back in person for 2023. I hope you'll join us in New Orleans uh, the first weekend of March for uh, several days of fantastic programming, uh, rich with CLE content and uh, unbeatable networking. So please uh, mark your calendars to join us for these and other programs. Um, so I think this is a a little bit about CPR. You're welcome to, to um, discuss with us after the program to learn more. And I want to thank our all-star panel that we have here today. This is the reason why we're here, to learn about investment disputes in Latin America and Brazil. And we could not do this without our fantastic moderator today, Carolina de Trazegui. I think I came close. Uh, Carolina is a Peruvian attorney. She's an independent arbitrator and she's an expert in the energy regulation sector. I hope that you will look at her bio in more detail in your CLE materials, as well as the bios of all of our uh, speakers here today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass to Carolina to start our program. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction, Knar. Uh, before starting, I think it's appropriate to thank Freshfield and Tosini Freire for hosting, and also to thank all of you attendees, both in person in the New York Arbitration Week and those are, that are taking the time to follow us uh, online. It's wonderful to act as moderator in this event with our, our magnificent speakers willing to share their experience all across America. As a Latin American lawyer and arbitrator, it's very interesting to listen to the different perspectives and perceptions. How can perceptions be different in a country and, and another, and how our own country is, is perceived, um, which I hope help us build a, a better regulatory framework in, in promotion of private investment and arbitration. Uh, so let me start by introducing them. Our panel today is Noriana Marigo, who is well known by all of you. She's the global co-head of international arbitration and co-head of the Latin American practice at Freshfields. Uh, Noriana's experience as counsel and arbitrator in many high stakes, uh, commercial investment treaty arbitrations, very casted in this discussion. Um, today, Rafael Alves comes to us from Brazil. He's a partner at MAMG Advogados and a professor at Sao Paulo Law School and co-chair of the CPR's Brazil Advisory Board. Uh, he has recently co-edited the CPR, I have it around here, <laughs> Corporate Council Guide for Arbitration in Brazil. And so I'm sure his contribution in this panel will be particularly enlightening to the Brazil arena. Um, Julio Cesar Rivera is sitting right next to me. He's an Argentina lawyer and a partner partner at Marval of Farrell Mayral. That was harder than in AMG. <laughs> uh, he's also a global adjunct professor at NYU at the NYU Law Abroad Program in, in Buenos Aires. 
And last but not least, we have here today with us via Zoom, Marine Sola. Uh, thank you, Marine. It's hard to be the one that is at a distance. Uh, Marine Sola is also an Argentinian lawyer, uh, and she's the one to add in the in-house perspective into this panel. Uh, as she's not only involved with ICC in Argentina, but is head of uh, the litigation practice at Pan American Energy with operations in Argentina, Bolivia, Mexico, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. I think, I hope I don't for, didn't forget anyone, <laughs> any country. So even though you're not physically here, Marines, it's great to have you on board and we will make sure that the public hears a lot from you, what you have to say from the in-house uh, perspective. Uh, now, now our topic. For, for the last 20 years, Latin America has been a fertile environment for investor state arbitration. From the cases in Argentina in the early 2000s, those against Venezuela, and uh, Ecuador, Mexico, Bolivia, and more recently, Peru and Colombia, uh, investment treaty disputes in the region have continued to arise. Uh, uh, investment arbitrations against Latin American countries represent the largest share of cases when comparing caseloads by region. Um, between 1995 and 2010, uh, more than one third of all investor state arbitrations registered worldwide were in Latin America. And personally, I was sorry to read that Peru was the most, <laughs> the most frequent respondent in 2020 and apparently in 2021. <laughs> Also, you know, out of 66 cases registered by ICSID in 2021, 24 are against Latin American states. And then the topic of this uh, New York arbitration week, right? Who's in charge? It, inviting us to reflect in, in what's the best way for efficient resolution of disputes. You know, it, is, it is well known that investors have resorted to arbitration because it offers greater procedural flexibility and the prospect of a neutral forum. But do they really have access to efficient resolution of disputes? And are they really in, in control of their arbitration? And let's see what, what our panelists think. Um, so being in control requires in the first place to have arbitration uh, available. Uh, as you all know, there are multiple ways to secure a consent to arbitrate. And basic, mainly it has evolved in two tracks, right? Commercial arbitration and investor state dispute. So perhaps, Julio, you can start introducing our public as to what options are available to national and international investors. Thank you, Carolina, for, for the presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, basically, the, the most typical way to, to secure consent to, to arbitrate is to, to put an arbitration clause in a contract, basically saying that all disputes concerning or related to this contract may be submitted to arbitration. That is the, the most typical way to, to secure uh, consent to arbitrate. More exceptionally, it is theoretically possible to agree to arbitrate after a specific dispute has arisen, but in my experience, uh, I have never seen that. Uh, it is very unlikely to happen. And then when it comes to, to investment arbitration, then uh, what the investor might do is to, I mean, to accept the offer to arbitrate contained in bilateral investment treaties or multilateral investment treaties, or more exceptionally, the offer to arbitrate contained in state legislation. Uh, those are basically the, the most common way to, to secure consent to, to, to arbitrate. So what are the main practical differences between an arbitration derived from an arbitration agreement or contract and from an offer made by a state in a BIT or investment law? And how, how do you think they're relevant in your jurisdiction? Con concerning the first part of the question, is investment arbitration is based on a treaty signed uh, between states. Uh, a state signed bilateral investment treaty, multilateral investment treaties that basically provide for certain warranties and rights uh, for the investors. And although the treaty is signed between states, uh, the, the treaty contains, as I, as I said before, an offer to, to arbitrate from the state that may be accepted by the investors. So at the end, in a nutshell, the investor's claim will be a treaty breach. Um, and to be able to file that claim, the investors must meet certain national, nationality requirements as defined in the treaty. You have to have the right nationality to, to be able to file that claim. On the other hand, commercial arbitration is based on a contract. Uh, 
essentially the claim will be a breach of contract based on domestic law. The domestic law agreed by the parties in the contract is not governed by international law. Of course, there might be some overlapping sometimes because sometimes a breach of a contract itself may amount to a breach of a treaty, but uh, the distinction still, still holds. And another significant difference is that uh, investment arbitration involves, in many cases, the review of uh, public policy regulation, from health regulation to environmental regulations, public utility tariffs, etc. So the public interest at stake has led to much more transparency than what we're used to in commercial cases. And sometimes even the participation of third parties in the arbitrations, through NGOs, et cetera. On the other hand, commercial arbitration tend to be much more confidential. Awards are not published in principle. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily imply that there is no public interest at stake in commercial arbitration. In many cases, contracts are terminated or modified by states because of public policy regulation. So uh, it's not that always uh, in commercial arbitration, there is no public interest at stake. And the second part of your question, Carolina, the impact on, on my on a specific jurisdiction like Argentina, maybe the most delicate issue is the legal strategy. When you have two different avenues available, commercial arbitration and investment arbitration is which one you will pursue. You will file only for investment arbitration, in most cases by the shareholders. Will you also file the commercial arbitration or local litigation before the domestic court by the local company? Which factors you should take into account when you, are, you, you have to make that decision? Well, that is when it comes to the impact of, of the distinction, it's, it's probably the most delicate issue you have to, to address um, uh, in the legal strategy. And, and sometimes the, the, the line gets a little bit blurry, right? For example, in, in, in Peru, uh, it's very common to have uh, concession agreements or investment agreements resort to exit arbitration. So even though it's actually a contractual arbitration, you're still discussing investment issues. And uh, maybe I can invite other speakers to, to comment on this. Uh, Noyana, what should an investor take into consideration in your views when, when choosing between commercial and, and investment arbitration? Thank you and good morning, everyone. I think following up on all of the elements that Julio mentioned, and it depends on your strategy and, and your specific case, right? But talking about the, the governing law, as Julio said, you in bilateral investment treaty arbitration, you, have, you apply um, international law or the treaty. In some cases, that can be much more beneficial than applying domestic law in a commercial arbitration. And just to give you an example, if you have a domestic law that provides for a limit to the compensation. You might wanna go with investment arbitration because you have normally the standard of fair market value of the investment prior to the measures. So that might give you more, uh, more, more, more in damages. Conversely, you might have punitive damages, for example, in your domestic law, and you might not get that in international and international law. So at that point, you might wanna go um, with commercial arbitration. You can have interest. In many countries, you have legal um, interest, which are very low, but if you go to uh, international arbitration, you might be able to get at least commercial rates or sometimes even uh, cost of equity, which is much higher. So that can be one of the considerations. The other one is the, um, the powers of the state. Sometimes you are limited by domestic law, administrative law, what the state can do. Sorry, domestic law, you will have much more, much more powers. Under international law, under the fair and equitable treatment standard, for example, it can be more limited. What is reasonable under domestic law might be different from what is reasonable under international law or seen by an international tribunal. So that's another consideration. Provisional measures, for example. If you know that you need provisional measures right away when you start the arbitration, if you go to investment and arbitration, it might take you six months or a year to constitute a tribunal. So by the time you get a provisional measure, unless you want to go to the domestic courts, which normally you don't want to do, and in exit, once you start the arbitration, you cannot go to domestic courts, even for 
provisional measures, you might want to go to commercial arbitration because if you have, for example, any of the commercial rules that allow for emergency arbitrators, you can get that right away. So that's another consideration. Relief sought. If you're, you're looking for is a specific performance of the contract, go to commercial arbitration. Bilateral investment treaty arbitration will give you compensation, maybe in four years, five years. But if you want something that ensures that you your contract is going to be complied with, um, the, the, the state is going to comply with the contract now, you won't have a, a relief in investment arbitration. Leverage in negotiations. In general, if you start an investment arbitration, it's public, it's transparent. The state might feel a bit more pressure to negotiate and settle before going to even arbitration or to a final hearing. Commercial arbitration is um, generally um, confidential, so another consideration to take into account. And then I'm sure uh, Ines is going to come to that, the length and costs, because that's what the clients complain of. And so I will leave that part to, to Ines. I, I, I don't introduce hearing a bit just, just before going to Ines. What about legal strategy? Like, for example, I, I guess if you have an arbitration under domestic law, your appointment of arbitrations or strategy for appointing arbitrations is significantly different, would you say, to, to investment arbitration? Yeah, you have to be very careful depending on the rules that you're applying in your commercial or domestic arbitration. Some institutions, local institutions, have a closed list of arbitrators or they have different rules on how you, the, the, the criteria that, that you apply for independency or neutrality of the arbitrators. And like, also the relevance of domestic laws, right? Like maybe you may feel, think different about having an international arbitrator if you are like... Uh, I know what you mean. Um, that's part of the strategy when you have a, a dispute, more than whether it's domestic or not, we think that it depends on, sometimes you want to have someone who has a more broader view of the contract, you might want to go with civil law arbitrator, even if you have a contract that is common law, or with a common law uh, regulation, or the other way around. Although today, those concepts of civil law and, com and common law are, are a little bit blurred, but Normally, it gives you part of the strategy to thinking of the legal background of the arbitrator and also what kind of decisions they have taken. Sure. Um, and, and surely, as you said, like Ines will have some thoughts to share from the in-house uh, point of view regarding the choice between contractual and investment arbitration. So we, we hear you, Ines. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, sorry, I missed the after, after party yesterday, but you know, digital can has its limitations. So um, uh, indeed, uh, it's a difficult choice. And as Noyana said, and Julio, uh, there are many things to consider. Uh, the short answer, I think it's de it depends. Uh, what uh, what is the best choice you will have to analyze every time case by case situation regarding what type of business you're doing and with whom. So uh, I would say that as investors and users of arbitration, we should do this analysis having many uh, things in mind. The first one is where you are doing business. Uh, and uh, there is in LATAM a tendency, we see a trend going towards uh, contract arbitration. Um, this is, of course, something that we see, especially in the energy sector where I work, because um, we work very close, of course, to the public sector. We have millions of regulations, uh, as you all know, but also we are many times partners with uh, the public sector. So we're working very close to them. And as you know, in LATAM, there is um, a, a political um, factor um, that many times uh, complicates the choice uh, of investment arbitration. Um, there have been many, many 
investment arbitrations. And I don't know if Argentina is still number one, uh, but probably, or <laughs> I think uh, now we have um, uh, new countries that are um, fighting for the first place. But uh, Argentina had many Western arbitrations, but also many other countries in Latin America. This has uh, caused uh, many political problems that affect business. Uh, so the choice you, you make is very much affected by, as I said before, political reasons. And the first thing you want to do is to be able to go move forward uh, with your business. So when you choose, uh, you will have to um, analyze all the aspects that were uh, brought up by Noyana, and always remember that even if you choose investment arbitration, domestic law uh, will probably still uh, a very relevant factor in your case. So uh, this is also uh, a concern because we will talk about this uh, um, later, but enforcement of awards uh, is also a problem. So not only, and this is something that you will keep in mind when uh, you're choosing what type of arbitration to have uh, on uh, an operation or uh, a, a case. Uh, because of political reasons, sometimes a, a contractual arbitration uh, will seem easier to enforce than an investment arbitration. Um, and this is something that we'll talk about later. So the short answer is it depends. Uh, we work very closely with governments and uh, we want to get things done. And we worry also very much about costs and efficiency, efficiency in general. So yes, uh, as Noyana said, all, all users are very worried about costs and investment arbitration has become very, very expensive, but also very lengthy. And uh, many times, as you know, uh, if you practice commercial arbitrations, uh, you know that you will be able to have an award much faster uh, if you have a contractual arbitration than if you have an investment arbitration. So these are um, some of the things that we have in mind when we uh, try to, to decide on what type of arbitration to choose. So I, I, I grasp from, from your, your views, Ines, that, that, that um, the decision may differ if you have like an ongoing business versus like a stalled business like an expropriation or, or something that serious and that uh, the close relationship with the government is something important that that investors really it makes us really really uh care about uh, in the case of ongoing uh businesses and uh well uh, this this takes me a little bit to to brazil brazil stands apart from this network of investment protection brazil has not signed the exit uh convention and even though adherence to the exit convention is not necessary for states to make binding offers to resolve treaty disputes through investor state arbitrations, it is yet starting to put some BITs into force, uh, which include not right, no right to direct resource against host states, if I get you well, Rafael. Um, no, no, do not include investor state arbitrator, but rather state to state arbitrator. Uh, so given that context, um, what are the options or the best available options for investor in Brazil, um, given the country's traditional stance on invest, international investment treaties. Thank you, Carolina. Brazil's situation is so peculiar that we need a specific question just for our country. <laughs> First of all, let me thank the organizers, thank uh, Fresh Foods again for hosting us, Tosini Freire, and CPR as well. Uh, my, my job here would be much easier because of the chapter in our CPR guide regarding investments in Brazil. So I'd like to thank Alex Ibrahim, Matheus Oliveira, and also uh, Ricardo uh, Gardini, because it's, it's, uh, it's a fantastic chapter and makes my 
my role here much easier. I'll be commenting on a lot of what you have written in, in, in our guide. So to answer your question, uh, Carolina, what are the options for investors in Brazil? Uh, the, the short answer is commercial arbitration. I'll give you now the long answer, which is and explain you why we don't have investment arbitration in Brazil. Uh, Brazil did sign in the past several uh, BITs. As Karina mentioned, we are not a party to the uh, ICSID convention, to the Washington convention, but we did sign some BITs in the past. Those BITs uh, never in entered into force because they were not ratified by the Brazilian parliament. So that's the first generation of BITs, let me put it this way, the traditional BITs that we, we are all aware of. Now, uh, there's a new trend in Brazil for investment protection. Uh, the government decided to draft a new model for BITs. They call it the uh, Cooperation and Facilitation Investment Agreements. This is a new name. And uh, the structure uh, resembles, of course, the traditional BIT, but with some very important differences, both on the substantive aspect and the procedural aspect. And on the procedural side, I can discuss later on the substantive side, but on the procedural side, as Karina mentioned, there's no investor state arbitration in those BITs, meaning an investor is not allowed to start arbitration directly against the state under those BITs. Uh, it needs to resort to state to state arbitration, which is very, very hard to happen in the practice. And even if it does, the legal remedies available for the investor in that state to state arbitration are very different from investor state arbitration. So uh, that path, uh, it remains still to be seen whether it will uh, attract foreign investors in Brazil because of that specific, those specific treaties. So we have signed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 15 of those new treaties, bilateral treaties, so-called cooperation and facilitation uh, investment treaties, agreement, sorry. And out of those 15, the new generation of BITs, uh, three of them are already in force, uh, Angola, Mexico, and the Mercosul uh, agreement, which comprises Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay. Uh, so we have those in force. Uh, I, I, I have no uh, experience with that, with those uh, treaties. I have asked some colleagues in Brazil working with trade law specifically, and they also didn't have an experience yet. Fairly new, uh, they have been in force for the past three or four years, those, those agreements. And the other ones, the 12 other, are still pending ratification uh, in the parliament. So they might get into force in the coming years. And before the state to state arbitration, we also have other, uh, on the procedural side as well, we also have other uh, mechanisms, um, particularly the ombudsman, which is a new uh, element in our uh, uh, framework, legal framework for investment protection. And that ombudsman is already in place in Brazil. So CAMEX, it's a, it's a body of the Brazilian government entitled to receive inquiries and complaints and, and um, and doubts about uh, investment protection in Brazil. So the ombudsman is, I would say, uh, an attempt to prevent disputes uh, in those uh, investment treaties uh, legal framework. But still, uh, we don't talk much about you know who had ex actual experience on, in that in that regard in using ombudsman in Brazil. Apparently, it's uh, the Brazilian government tried to mirror the Korean experience with with uh, such uh, such feature. So investment arbitration in Brazil under those those treaties, it's we have to be it's yet to be seen whether it will uh, actually in practice mean um, protection any sort of protection to foreign investors in Brazil. I have my doubts, but on the commercial side, going back to your question and my answer, so you should choose commercial arbitration. On the commercial side, the good news is that we have an arbitration friendly jurisdiction in Brazil. And uh, since our amendment of the Brazilian Arbitration Act in 2015, uh, the public sector embraced arbitration. And this is fairly new as well, I would say for the past six or seven years. 
we have uh, both in the local level, local government, state government, and federal government, all the agencies, um, state-owned entities, they have all embraced arbitration in Brazil for the past seven years at least. And now we have uh, public attorneys dedicated, specialized in arbitration, dedicated to arbitration. They work only with arbitration in some of those levels of government. They know what they're doing, which means that we are not any longer discussing anti-arbitration injunctions. You know, they're not dodging their obligations to arbitrate. We're discussing the merits with them. And it is, it is a secure environment. Uh, doing arbitration in Brazil against state or public entities, it is a secure environment. And going back to Mayana's comments on the domestic law, our, our domestic law gives protection to investors in Brazil. Uh, I can compare to, it depends on, on which treaty you're discussing to compare with, the, with Brazilian domestic law, but it is, it is, it is a good protection for, for an investor there. And, and we do have, and we use emergency arbitrators as well in, in the commercial settings against the state and we have no problems in enforcing those decisions. So, you know, in, in the commercial side, we have good news. So I would definitely favor going into commercial arbitration and definitely including arbitration clauses in your contract with the government instead of litigating in court. So that would be my, my answer. Good news is that there, there is a way to go to arbitration. And from what you're saying, Rafael, uh, Seems that Brazilian companies and international investors are generally comfortable with, with commercial arbitration as a means of settling national and international disputes in, in Brazil. Um, however, uh, investment treaties create some incentives for states to maintain steady legal frameworks and avoid suddenly policy changes that adversely affect investments. And also uh, ICSID, for example, provides investors and states with a reliable procedural framework and the localized international forum. Um, Noyana also mentioned something that I thought was very relevant, the negotiation leverage that a state has when, when facing international responsibility. Um, in your opinion, do, do these commercial options offer the same level of transparency and accountability and uh, leverage? So I'll start with transparency. Um, public arbitrations in Brazil are public, so they have to be in public domain. Not all of the dockets, not all of the documents, but most of it, most of them should be in public domain because it's, you know, by law, they should be public. Uh, but we're still uh, developing our, our practice in Brazil, even with the uh, arbitral institutions to make sure we get more transparency overall for commercial arbitration, and particularly for, for those uh, arbitrations related to the, against the government or the state or state-owned entities. So I'm not sure it is easy to compare, you know, our level of transparency in commercial arbitration in Brazil to the level of transparency in investment arbitration in general. Uh, of course, there has been a huge effort worldwide to increase transparency in investment arbitration. And, you know, since UNCITRAL has decided to, to, uh, to work on this, on this front, I think we have developed a lot and increased transparency in general for investment arbitration. But I would say in Brazil, commercial arbitration is transparent when, when it deals with the government and is accountable. The, comp the comparison is, dif is difficult because you should uh, have to, to give at least a parameter to, to make that comparison. But it is, it is fairly transparent and, and accountable. And, and what about uh, leverage for negotiating with the state? Do you think like going to commercial arbitration uh, empowers investment in, in the investor in negotiating? That's a very good question. Uh, the problem there lies uh, within the government, not the investor, because the problem is that for a public attorney to settle a case in Brazil, uh, it's not that easy. Uh, and usually that public attorney is subject to several layers of control, public control. If, uh, he or she will have to justify why he or she settled that case specifically. It's very different from the commercial setting. Peru, they will never settle. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that creates, uh, you know, that, that is not an incentive to settle, which is very unfortunate because uh, I think it will be in the public's interest or 
but let's say it would be better for the public interest sometimes to settle a case than to let it you know go to uh, to trial or to the judgment well, they will also face responsibility plus the staggering costs of the arbitration anyway if they receive an award they will not no, no one of from the public side will, will be responsible for that award right you're basically outsourcing our responsibility for for that case someone else is deciding for you so it's it's convenient, but I'm not sure this is the, the best way to protect public interest. So I would like to see in my country moving forward, I would like to see more um, a better uh, body of, of a better legal framework to protect settlements and arbitration in public arbitrations. Because I think, you know, some, as we do in practice, in, in our private practice, sometimes settlement is the best course of action. And why wouldn't that be the same for the same case for uh, public arbitrations. Uh, maybe we can have Ines to comment on the in-house uh, council experience here. Uh, in your experience, Ines, do you think companies are uh, comfortable and or well protected with a Brazilian arbitration situation? Thank you, Carolina. Um, yes, uh, as Rafael said, um, Brazil is quite a special case regarding arbitration, but Brazil is special in everything, right? Um, and I think that companies uh, do feel that arbitration is an option, but commercial arbitration or contractual arbitration, of course, you do not have this umbrella protection that investment arbitration provides for uh, investors in general. I don't think that has had a tremendous effect on investment in Brazil. I don't have the numbers, but this is not something that has uh, usually come up in discussions uh, between companies. Uh, we, uh, we do feel that you have to be very uh, in the energy sector as partners of Brazilian companies, uh, state companies, uh, and state entities in general, the drafting of the uh, arbitration clause uh, tends to be a problem. I know we're going to speak about that in detail later, but uh, I think that in Brazil in particular, you do have to uh, have um, very good Brazilian lawyers helping you. Uh, and uh, but I do, but I think that companies um, uh, feel that there is um, an acceptance of arbitration, and uh, there is a, a very large practice of arbitration in Brazil that makes investors uh, comfortable regarding uh, um, the development and enforcement of the of the eventual award. I do agree with Rafael that settlements are very difficult. Uh, this is something that you, we see in LATAM in general. Uh, I would like to say that they're difficult, but not impossible. And uh, uh, you do, there is a possibility of settlement, but laws uh, should change in that regard because the responsibility for the public official makes it very, very difficult and you will have to go to the highest levels to be able to reach a settlement. Uh, and that of course uh, means more time and costs. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the, the situation in Brazil is a situation that is favorable to investors. It's, um, I believe that it's better than it, ha it has been in a, in a while. Yeah, it's something on settlements because uh, talking about um, public officials today, I think it's very difficult to, to today to be the position of a public official. Um, maybe it, until five years ago, we had conversations with, with states about settlement and were quite reasonable conversations that we, we actually reached settlements. The problem is, even if you go to the highest level, because we have decree, presidential decrees for some of the settlements, then when the governments change, you have the new government. Now there's a whole wave of reopening and questioning the settlements that were done. So today it's almost impossible to have a discussion with a public official about settling. But that also creates problems because now we are seeing the opposite of when you get an award and it's public that that 
public official could have settled the case for half of the price, but went through the arbitration, the cost of the arbitration, and then ended up with a, an award that is much more expensive, then that official is also put into question for not having done the right thing for the state. So I think today we're in a very difficult situation, which is not good for the states because they end up paying much more. And it's not good for the companies because sometimes we just need to settle to continue the relationship. Uh, and it's very difficult for the public officials where are in a very, I, I would say dangerous because most of them can either suffer criminal consequences. And I understand that in Colombia, even you pay with your own patrimony um, or your own assets and any, any responsibility and even your your heirs can inherit the debt and you don't have even the beneficial of the inventario. So I think it's, it's very, very dramatic. That sounds even worse than Peru, which is hard. <laughs> It, is it possible, Rafael, do you think that Brazil will change its stand in the light of its uh, national private companies investing abroad or like break into international investment arbitration? No, short answer is no, we're not going to change. This is what we have for investment arbitration in Brazil, so <laughs> let's live with it. Uh, and again, we we'll start to commercial arbitration. So inward, inward investment is covered by commercial arbitration, as, as we discussed, but this no doubt impacts not only foreign investment in Brazil, but also Brazilian capital export or investment abroad. Uh, it seems then that to have access to investment arbitration, you have to restructure and go out of Brazil and channel your investments through other states. Um, we've seen then of that, for example, Peru has a very large claim now uh, by a Brazilian investor uh, that has been channeled through the Luxembourg, Belgian Luxembourg BIT. Um, treaty planning is frequently used by investors globally uh, uh, in a way that guarantees coverage. Um, Noyana, can you comment on the need of Brazilian investors abroad to restructure their investments to get VIT protection? And also, what is the right moment and the right way to engage in treaty planning in order to avoid denial of benefits? Yeah, of course. So it's a little bit unfair because foreign investors cannot be protected when they invest in Brazil, but Brazilian investors have been using treaty structuring to get protection, of course, when they export capital. Um, as always, you, you, you can structure or restructure if you realize that you don't have the right protection under the treaty. There are certain things that you have to keep in mind always is first, look at the language of the treaty. We had experiences with people restructuring just using a treaty and then when you when the dispute arises and they come to us and we look at the restructuring, they went with a treaty that require a substantial business in that jurisdiction or require or have a denial of benefit clause that needs that either you have business there or you are controlled by the same nationality. You don't comply with that, you get zero protection. Or even some treaties like the Swiss treaties, they, they require Swiss control like all the way up. So you can only benefit from that if you are a Swiss investor. So always- the Definition of investor yeah, there is- like very, It's very like important to look at each treaty and not use um, templates. And the second very important point is that time when do you restructure let's say the sooner the better and the better is when you are investing but let's say that you want to restructure later um what you have to be careful is uh that there is that the the, the, the dispute has an you cannot foresee the the, the the case law says that the, the specific dispute cannot reasonably be foreseen at the time you restructure and there are two ways in, in light of the case law that it can go. Either they say that you were abusing the right and you just restructured to um, get international protection and that some tribunals have said that that's an abuse of rights, or they just say that whatever damage you suffer before the restructuring is not gonna be covered by the investment. And that, that's the decision that the that the Conoco Phillips uh, tribunal got and the um, uh, versus Venezuela. And basically it's, it's better in the sense of, okay, you lose some of the damages, but you can still have the claim, but the, the, the other tribunals are just denied jurisdiction because of that. Interesting. Ines, um, do you have any comments on this from the point of view of counsel? Is restructuring in order to gain access to treaty protection something that is appealing to you or that you may deemed necessary as an investor or 
or in the absence thereof, commercial arbitration would, would suffice? Well, uh, it would depend, of course, uh, of the ongoing business, the type of relationship you have with the state and the, the, the size of the investment. Uh, and uh, because you have this, you have to keep in mind that this is quite expensive. Uh, so I think that's the main concern regarding restructuring. Um, uh, so I would say that it's something that uh, we would definitely analyze case by case, but it's one of the options, yes. And in, in your experience, does lack of access to investment arbitration deter investments in Brazil or? In my experience, it, it doesn't. Uh, of course, it's the first thing that you say as in-house counsel, remember, they don't have investment arbitration. Um, so I, uh, you do have to remind uh, uh, people that this is the case because it is quite an exception, uh, but I don't think it deters investment in Brazil. Thank you. What about you, Rafael? Do you have any views on that? Or? No, I don't think it... Uh, uh, the, the absence or you know the legal framework that we have for investment in Brazil, I don't think that framework has uh, been an obstacle to attract foreign investors in Brazil because we have been using commercial arbitration since 96 at least. So we have an option. If we didn't have that option, then I would I would agree. Yeah. I think you have the market, which is what investors <laughs> require. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. So let's take have a have a step back, zooming out of investor state arbitration. And as for contractual investment or commercial arbitration, um, drafting the contract is a particularly relevant aspect. We've mentioned this before. In order to adequately protect the investments and to remain in control of the arbitration. Uh, so having this in mind, uh, what are for you, Julio, the the main aspects to consider as to clause drafting? I want to highlight three three things to keep in mind when drafting a contract, in particular with government or state-owned entities. The, the first risk you have is the risk of interference with arbitration. So, and the best way to deal with that risk is to have the seat of arbitration abroad um, to to avoid the control of the arbitration proceeding by domestic court. The problem with that solution is that it's not always available in all Latin American countries. In, in some Latin American countries, uh, it's mandatory to have the seat in the in the country when you are dealing with the state. So you have to have you have to be careful about that. Second, uh, in can, in federal countries such as Argentina, if you are arbitrating with a province or state you also have to try to fix the seat of arbitration outside of that province. In, in my experience, all the contracts I've seen with provinces that contemplate arbitration, they have the seat in Buenos Aires and not in the province. The, the second thing that is very important if you want to dilute the risk of interference or, or, or the risk of lack of collaboration of the state <laughs> is to have the institutional arbitration. Always institutions have more tools with the, to deal with uh, parties that don't want to collaborate with the proceedings. Uh, uh, it's much better than ad hoc proceedings. Third, and this in, in one case I've seen and I'm working, the parties agree to have a penalty clause in case of interference with arbitration. And, uh, in a very specific form of interference with if there is an anti seat arbitration, there is a penalty clause. And last, I could mention that, and this is more anecdotal, but if you can fix an email in the contract where the state or the state of entity can be served, that could be useful. For example, in, in one dispute I have now, the state argued that they hadn't agreed to be served by email, although it was clear in institutional rules that, that that was a possibility, and, and they refused to, to participate in the, in the proceedings. The, the second thing you have to look at, apart from the risk of interference, 
is does the arbitration law apply to state contracts? Although it means Latin American countries have modern arbitration law based on the modern law, in some cases, such as Argentina, the arbitration law doesn't apply to contract governed by public law, or only to contract governed by private law. So the question is, which law does it apply to arbitration with the state in Argentina? And the answer is, is basically done in a vacuum. There is no arbitration law that applies to arbitration uh, with the state in which they are governed by public law. Uh, how do you deal with that? What can you do? Again, institutional arbitration. Why? Because in the rules of the institution, you will have some basic rule like the principle of separability, the competence, competence, etc., that will help you uh, to deal with this vacuum. Second, try to put some of these principles into the arbitration clause. I've seen that in many contracts with Argentine government is you have the separability principle, the competence, competence principle in the arbitration clause. Uh, so these are some of the ways to deal with the lack of a modern arbitration legislation um, concerning arbitration with the state parties. And the third one, which is also essential, and it's much more difficult to deal with it, you have to know that in Argentina and in other Latin American countries that have an administrative law based on the French model is the, the administration will have powers, implicit powers, even though they are not express, expressly mentioned in the contract. In Argentina, for example, in our public law, the state has implicit power to mod unilaterally modify the contract, to unilaterally terminate the contract with very little compensation, very debatable where the loss of income is admissible. So you have to be aware that you have contract governed by Argentinian public law, the state will have much more power than the one that are contained in the contract. So this is a, one of the most delicate issues when you are contracting with, with the Argentinian government. It's interesting all that, that you mentioned because in, in arbitrating against the state, the investor does not always have a lot of space to negotiate the clauses, right? Even though is uh, common in many countries, like for big projects or relevant projects to have a consultation phase on the contracts. Uh, many Latin American states, or at least in my experience in Peru, usually operate with a model clause where there is little room for change. Um, but even, even though negotiation is limited, there are some very crucial aspects where the investor may have a say. Like, for example, in, in Peru, investment agreements, uh, there is usually a threshold that defines the seat of the arbitration. And this, like, above certain uh, amount at stake, you resort to exit or uncitral and below that amount to domestic arbitration. And this decision may be crucial to making arbitration viable. Like I don't think any investor would want to address the staggering costs and time for, of international arbitration for low amounts. I've, I've seen clauses that resort to exceed at $1 million, which is uh, crazy. Um, maybe I can invite other panelists to comment on, on what are the key aspects from the point of view of the investor in, to be in control of the arbitration process. Uh, uh, Noyana, do you want to comment on, on some other Latin American jurisdictions? Maybe a couple of tips that can be used to when you are dealing with a state and you can ne not negotiate in your contract a seat outside of the uh, state that has host the investment. Because so sometimes um, that's, that's the most common situation. One is even if you have seat in the host country, you can try to regain control by appointing arbitrators that are not domiciled in the seat. That means that even if you will have the domestic courts trying to interfere with arbitration, at least two of the members of the tribunal are outside. So you might find a way to continue the arbitration. That relates to my question on appointment, appointing uh, yeah, of arbitration exactly. when you have like domestic so, law. Because it, what, what I've seen is that usually there's some resistance to appoint uh, international arbitrations where you are discussing Peruvian law, for example. Yeah, and there you have to, to balance. It's more important to have someone who knows the law, the applicable law, where maybe in civil law countries, you can have someone from Latin America that is as good 
in the legal principles, but then if it's domicile outside of the country, you might be able to avoid interference. So that I would go for someone sitting outside. The other thing that um, I've been able to negotiate, and of course it depends on the leverage you have, but it's sometimes you say, okay, I have domestic arbitration or sit, sit in the host country, but I want the shareholders to have special rights. And I've been able to negotiate exit arbitration for the shareholders for the contractual rights that derive from their shareholding in the company. So the company will go to domestic arbitration, but that is without prejudice of the right of the shareholder to do commercial arbitration and their exit. So um, that's another way that you can play around with that. And then a third way is not to put a seat. And if you have a, 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 a jurisdiction where it's not by law uh, that you need to go to domestic arbitration, if you don't put a seat and then you go to arbitration and then it's the tribunal who is gonna decide which is the applicable seat. And most of the time tribunals will find a neutral seat. So you're gonna get out of that jurisdiction. So these are three ways that you can try to work around. And Rafael, I, I don't think we covered this in the last uh, question. How do how does the Brazil situation differ from this in terms of negotiating uh, arbitration agreements? And is there a possibility to negotiate on a contract by contract basis? Uh, a limited possibility, but there is. And I second uh, in his comments that once you are into the realm of commercial arbitration with the state in Brazil, you should be very careful in drafting arbitration clauses. So a limited possibility of redrafting it, but you do have that uh, that possibility. And this is also an opportunity for me to thank Leo. Leo is here, Bocconi, he, he wrote the chapter on arbitration in, in several sectors in, in our guide and the public sector as well. And Leo mentioned that, uh, that as, as Julio mentioned in Argentina, uh, when you are in a clause against the state and the arbitration is the state, you need the seat to be in Brazil. That's also mandatory, you cannot contract around it. But if you can choose the seat within Brazil, that's already something better. And because we do have different seats in Brazil, for instance, uh, Sao Paulo is really arbitration friendly right now. It, it has always been arbitration friendly, the, seat of, the city of Sao Paulo. But nowadays it's even better because we have specific judges specialized in arbitration. And even for, uh, arbitration against the state. So they are, they are usually judges for commercial matters, but since they are handling arbitration matters, that would involve as well arbitration against the state. So you're dealing with a, a private law judge. It's much better than you know uh, a, a judge that which is uh, used to public law only. And we have seen in the past court interference, Julio, in Brazil, uh, court interference in arbitration, we have seen that in the past, even for commercial matters. But again, the good news is that we haven't seen such interference lately. So it's very unlikely that we got court interference in your arbitration against the state in Brazil. Very, very unlikely, I would say. So even if the, the law mandates that you put the city in Brazil, if you choose Sao Paulo or even Rio, you know, there's there are some safe seats there where you can have your arbitration without court interference. So that's but again, if you if you have a way to choose at least where the seat will be in Brazil, that could be contracted. I mean, that that's I would negotiate that. Thank you, Rafael and Ines. This is a point where we would definitely want you to comment from the point of view of the investor. And we've we've been discussing so much how well Julio said it's important to 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 get the arbitration abroad from the co-host country, but. I've had some clients in Peru, like see how they break their claim to stay in a domestic court to avoid the courts, <laughs> the costs. So, so it's interesting to see what's your perspective on this. Well, you never know where you're going to be, right? That's the first, you have to be careful uh, what clause uh, you draft. Um, and I understand that uh, clients can be difficult sometimes. Um, <laughs> So as you said, uh, Carolina, um, many times uh, the problem we have is, is that arbitration clauses uh, don't have many aspects that can be really negotiated. So this is one first hurdle that it can be very difficult. 
The second one, and that is a problem with certain companies, and I think that um, many times the commercial groups do not realize how important arbitration clauses are in general, and especially with states. And uh, sometimes um, uh, they are not given the time they truly require uh, uh, to have the best arbitration clause you can have. You already have a lot of uh, 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 limitations from the domestic law, from the state entities, uh, from your partners, from your investors also. So that is something that uh, you, you must have in mind. Uh, but uh, I agree with uh, um, uh, everything that uh, my colleagues have stated. One, uh, institutional arbitration is your safer bet. It's a shortcut. Uh, and uh, if you can uh, go for institutional arbitration, um, then uh, as Noyana said, uh, you the problem with the seat, uh, we mentioned a few countries, many countries in Latin America, Bolivia also, many countries in Latin America uh, will not allow you to choose uh, a seat outside the country, but uh, uh, having uh, a foreign arbitrator uh, uh, is a good, well, of course, it's not perfect, but it is a good way to at least uh, keep the arbitration moving forward, which is very much a concern. Um, and uh, regarding also the seat, as Rafael said, uh, not all cities in a country are the same. So that is something that you have to do your homework and choose the best city you can uh, uh, inside the country where you are investing. So I think that you have different strategies that you can use. Uh, it is a problem. You have a lot of limitations, but uh, to uh, dedicate uh, uh, enough time to have the best arbitration clause uh, you can is a very, very good investment for companies. And, and when you do get to negotiate the, the seat, uh, what, what kind of like aspects in your view are, are important, the most important to take into consideration when, when choosing a seat? Is it the, the approach or relationship with courts or um, if the country has adopted the, the UNCITRAL model law or if there's a sufficient pool of experience and qualified arbitrators, what kind of things do you, do you work around the seat? Well, uh, of course, the first thing, as you said, uh, the first thing we analyze is uh, the relationship uh, with uh, uh, the relationship that courts have with arbitration in that city. Uh, of course, uh, procedural law, if you, you know, the, the applicable law uh, is always extremely relevant. Uh, but I would also add the, um, the familiarity of the courts with the industry. Uh, and this is something that uh, is quite useful um, because uh, they, they will understand the needs to solve certain problems and will be usually uh, uh, a bit uh, less um, pro-state, to put it in a way, <laughs> uh, because they, they are familiar with uh, the industry. So that is something that you, you should also have in mind. Thank you, Ines. And one, one last question for panel uh, members before uh, opening the floor for, for questions of the public. Being in control of the process is hardly relevant if the investor cannot secure payment of the, the award. And uh, this is more often than not the case when you have to get in line to be paid. Like just uh, yesterday, uh, an investor in Peru was awarded 177 million in damages stemming from an ICC arbitration, for example. Um, so I would love to hear your views on ways to secure payment from the state in Latin American jurisdictions. I don't know if you want to, to start, Noyana. I can. In general, it's 
there is this idea that states don't pay voluntarily their awards. And actually, it's not true. When you look at the statistics, most of the awards are paid voluntarily. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it's a global settlement. Sometimes you get paid in bonds. But in general, except for Venezuela at the moment, due to the financial circumstances and some countries in Africa, most of the countries, even Argentina, after saying for many years that it was not going to pay the award, has paid almost all of the, the awards at the moment. Um, so in general, you get paid. Uh, today, it's also very useful that there has been a market that has developed in the last couple of years with investment funds that actually are buying uh, awards. So you, don't, you get a discount, of course, but you can monetize very quickly and you don't have to face the risk of enforcement. And third, depending on the arbitration, let's say if you are you have an investment arbitration and you can use depending on on how involved the country can be in diplomatic uh, negotiations. So most of the time they you can get the state to put some pressure. And that was the case, for example, of the United States when Argentina was not paying the awards uh, that were issued in favor of American investors, they basically didn't vote for or didn't approve World Bank loans for a while. And they also uh, suspended some of the trade benefits with Argentina. And that, of course, put pressure on, and made uh, Argentina pay some of the awards. So in general, I think you get paid. And then if you're in investment arbitration, you have some other diplomatic avenues to, to get paid. Are there any practical differences to consider stemming from commercial and investment arbitration? Yeah, of course. So if you have ICSID, you your award has the same effect that at the, the final the solution the final decision of the final court in any of the countries that have signed the ICSID convention. So you don't need Exequador. So you just go and enforce, and then we can discuss some countries have a special provision on how you get pay so for example you have to register the 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 award just to get into the budget of the state uh, but in principle you shouldn't do anything but just uh claim claim payment um then if you have a commercial award of course you are under the new york convention and the new york convention you have very limited grounds but in general you need recognition in each of the in each of the states so it might take a little bit longer and i might get a little more requirements uh, Julio, uh, I think you would like to comment on some recent state strategies regarding requests for enforcement of payments and awards, especially the Argentina case. Yes, well, most of our creditors that managed to, to get paid, they, they got paid in Argentina through a settlement that in change basically the payment with public bonds and a sort of 25% reduction of the claim. Uh, no award creditor has dared to enforce an exit award in Argentina until this year, basically because of the risk of court tax, which is 3% of the claim in Argentina, and, and, the, and, the, and the cost of, of the proceedings in, in the payment of attorney fees, which can be significant. This year, finally, one foreign investor is, is trying, is, is attempting to, to enforce an exit award. In, before Argentinian court, it's a very small award, it's $1 million award on costs. And the state attorney that filed a non binding opinion on, on whether this enforcement was admissible expressly acknowledged that uh, under Article 54 of the Exit Convention, there is no need to, to, to file for the exequatur, that the, that the decision must be enforced as any local decision. Uh, uh, issued by a final court in Argentina, which, and this is the second part of the problem is, well, how a final decision from a domestic court in Argentina is enforced, and well, you have to go to the Ministry of Economy, request inclusion of the credit in the budget, and it will be paid in principle the next year. If it's not included, then you have to initiate enforcement actions again. So. What we don't know is, one, it is acknowledged as a final judgment from a final court in Argentina is, what next? And we will see now in, in this case whether Argentina will voluntarily comply or not with the, with the court decision. Rafael, would you, would you like to make a very brief comment on 
on Brazil and the amendments to the Arbitration Act? Sure. Uh, so in Brazil, again, a peculiar system of payments um, that our constitution uh, created. Uh, <laughs> once you have an order against the state, ordering the state to pay, you don't get paid immediately. Those, that, those are the bad news. You, you enter into this regime called precatorios, I mean, you have to stay in line with other creditors and wait until you have, it, it's your turn to be paid. And that can take several years, depending on the level of the government, local, depending on the city, depending on the state, depending if it's the federal level, they all have different deadlines to pay you. It could take up to 10 years. So it's a lot of, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue. The good news is that once you are in commercial arbitration and some types of partnerships, for instance, public partner, public-private partnerships, that regime allow you to have collaterals, guarantees, and for instance, receivables. And you can use those collaterals, those receivables to get uh, the payment of all your award. So we, this, is, this is good news. Uh, hopefully it will be enforced as uh, establishing the law in that way. So if you have the chance to use collaterals or, or financial guarantees in your partnership with the government, use them because otherwise you will be under the general rule of precatorius and have to wait in line. Thank you, Rafael. So, so maybe this is an appropriate moment. We have a couple of minutes for, for a couple of questions from the, from the, so I will open the floor, but before that I have been asked to do a logistical announcement. So I will read the CL, the, the mysterious CLE code, <laughs> which is 5186, I repeat, 5186. Uh, and with that said, uh, we have microphones across the room and we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. Just um, as you mentioned, the importance uh, of the seat, one of the most, of course, variable is the fact that uh, the seat, the legislation of the seat governs uh, annulment. So just what I'd like to turn very briefly to uh, annulment. Uh, we all know that under the, in the exit convention in, in countries where it is applicable, of course, we have uh, the annulment system within, written down within the uh, well, 1965 Washington Convention. Coming to Brazil, Rafael, you mentioned, uh, I was wondering, because you, you, you use the commercial path to deal with that, then um, do, you, do you accept, um, does the legislation accept also seats? outside Brazil? No, it does not. So the number and the scope, the number of annulment grounds, the number and the scope of each annulment grounds are those of Brazilian law in all events, if I understand correctly. Okay. Okay. Just a clarification. So, yes. Uh, as explained by Leo perfectly, you have to apply uh, Brazilian domestic law to those contracts, those commercial arbitration against the state, and those arbitrations have to be seated in Brazil and be in Portuguese. So those are the requirements, legal requirements. Okay, thank you. There we go. Uh, thank you for a very interesting panel. Uh, this question is for Noyana. Noyana, you mentioned uh, the structuring of investments to access international protection. I was wondering what other considerations a potential potential claimant should have, have in mind. Should it is it valid if it's only for accessing international protection? Should claimants have to prove other substantial reasons, for tax planning, corporate governance issues? Thank you. I was talking about two things, right? It was timing and whether the dispute was foreseen. And then there is another element is whether you're doing it only for the benefit of acquiring international protection. And it depends on, on the decisions. So there are, in principle, you it's legitimate to restructure only to acquire um, protection under international law. However, if you are too close to the time where the tribunal has to decide whether 
you restructured because you could foresee the, um, the dispute, then it would be much better for your case to have other considerations and have a paper trail where you consider, for example, tax planning, restructuring of your corporation, interna internationalization of your business, et cetera. So in principle, you cannot restructure you can restructure only for that, but if you are very close to the limit as whether it will be considered abusive or not, you better add other elements. And then sometimes it's easy to say whether you could foresee or not the dispute, but many other times it's very gray. For example, if you have a candidate that is doing is campaigning saying that is going to nationalize that entire sector, could you have foreseen or not? Some tribunals is okay, campaign not, but other tribunals might say, yeah, at that time, if you restructure after hearing all these, these statements and you knew there was a high probability that this candidate would make it to uh, the government, then you might be in a situation where jurisdiction is going to be denied. We had many cases in Venezuela when you had Chavez for years saying that they would nationalize the entire sector or several sectors. Is that enough for you to foresee the dispute? or the specific ones, we have tribunals where it has said, unless they are threatening with expropriating your specific investment, it's not reasonable, reasonably foreseeable. But I think we can all agree that that's very arguably and you don't wanna be in that situation. So my, my advice is always as soon as possible. And if you are investing in a country, just do your structuring very early on and you don't have to worry it and then maybe be involved in an arbitration for years and losing just because you were in a gray area. Do we have time for a last question or should we just, well, a quick one? Yeah. <laughs> sure, hi, uh, thank you so much. My name's Anna, I'm a Portuguese lawyer based in Lisbon. I heard your panel with a, a lot of interest and my question can go to any of the panelists uh, and it is, does the origin and or background of your counterparty, commercial or in, in investment, make a difference in terms of charting efficiency, uh, calling to the, the, the title of the panel. I'm thinking, for example, um, we heard at ICC Miami that China is the biggest trade partner with Latin America, including with Brazil as well. Uh, and in my experience working with Chinese parties, and I know I'm not the only Chinese speaker in the room, um, there's sometimes a big call for mediation or for attempts of settlement through the proceedings. So I was just curious about your experience. Someone mentioned uh, before uh, the political, when you are into the investment arena, you have the political element in the room as well. Uh, in the panel, I agree to that. And if going back to Brazil, if we're discussing in that legal framework for the prevention of disputes, that could work like the joint committee that we have in place in those investment agreements maybe the ombudsman, and, and, and that depends, then, then you're right, it depends on who the, your counterpart is, because then you have uh, the political interest, the political element, and you'll be, this, you'll be dealing with uh, the foreign policy of your country, you know, if it relates to that specific country or not, how you do trade with them. Uh, so in the, in the prevention era, arena, I think it could be, it could play a role. And if we are using diplomatic channels, it could also play a role. You know. But for commercial uh, investment disputes going into arbitration, I'm, I'm not so sure. Then I would invite my other colleagues to comment. In my experience, when you have um, a state-owned entity or a state as a counterparty, normally you have two considerations. In general, the government in in power doesn't want to pay the award, so they're going to try to use as many tactics as they can to pass the problem for the next government. And then also you have the problem that we were saying, if you don't use all of the available tools as you, as public official, are you gonna be judged in the future for not having done what you had to do? So you might be in a situation where annulment is not really um, granted because the award is okay, but if you're a public official, say, well, I have this tool, I will use it in order not to be judged later. The same if you have, I don't know, a gray area with an arbitrator, maybe you just, choose to, uh, to challenge the arbitrator because uh, either you wanna have more time or because you say, okay, maybe in the future, someone might say that I didn't do my job properly. So in general, you have other considerations than efficiency, unfortunately, and that makes arbitrations very, very long. Thank, thank you very much to everyone. I think we're, we're a little bit over time, so 
we appreciate it, especially to our speakers and public. Thank you, Ines, like you're listening from a distance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a very nice day. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on behalf of CPR. Our thanks again to Fresh Fields for hosting in collaboration with Tosini. And I want to give a special mention to Olivier Andre, who has organized this program with me, and he's done a fantastic job. So thank you so much. And to our panelists, please a round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you.